Hey Falcons, as we move into the second part of Unit 2, we're going to get into a little bit more nuance, and Chapter 9 and Chapter 10 are both further extensions on regression models. So, Chapter 9, think uh, more on regression. Uh, this is going to be thinking in terms of outliers and leverage. Those are the two things that we're going to focus on here. So, as usual, here are your homework problems. I would suggest you do uh, 5, 6, 7, 11, and 12 first, and then 13, 14, 15, and 20. This is short and sweet. There only are uh, two videos for this chapter, and then uh, we'll move to chapter 10. Just like always, our objective is to determine the line of best fit, think uh, LSRL, least square regression line, and describe the meaning. So I keep saying this over and over again, but I want you guys to get it clear. Linear regression is only appropriate for data that is sufficiently linear. Now, I keep saying that, but please don't forget that the fact that you fit a regression, you must acknowledge the linearity of any assessment. If it's a curved relationship, so a curved relationship between two variables might not be obvious when looking at a scatter plot, but will be more visible in a plot of the residuals. Essentially, the residual plot magnifies any deviation from linear. As always, when we look at the residual plot, we want to see nothing in a plot of the residuals. So let's look at example to see how we can see the bend. Given below, a scatter plot of heart rate against duration of emperor penguin dives looks pretty linear. We might be tempted to accept a linear model by inspection of the residual plot, or residuals versus duration reveals a pretty significant curve in the data. Re-examination of the original, re original scatter plot does show the curve in the data. So here's our original. As uh, Emperor Penguin dives further and further, the longer they're underwater, uh, their heart rate goes lower and lower. It's slowing down to kind of make sure that they're good. If we fit a line to this model, we see that we have an R squared of 71.5%. It's not bad, but we can obviously, like if we look, it looks linear. It doesn't look as linear as we want. By looking at the residual plot, we can clearly see that there is some sort of pattern going on in the residuals. It's not randomly scattered like we want. And when we see a pattern, we have to pause and say a linear model would not be appropriate. Okay, here's another example of a linear regression and an, an acceptable residual plot. So if we looked at predicted values for revenue versus actual values for revenue. Predicted versus actual, here is our data. Looks like a moderately strong positive linear association. And with our scatter plot, we see randomness. So we see random, let's say, random scatter. Which means if you just picked any point of these at value, it may be above, it may be below. Overall, our model, we don't see errors in our residual plot, which is a good thing. Here's another example of a good residual plot suggesting a good linear model. So if we have our scatter plot versus our x or explanatory and our response variable is our y, we see our positive association. And then with our, our model, I mean, it looks like it goes up and down, but in general, there is good random scatter. So a linear model is appropriate. And that's really what we want. Sufficiently linear. Sufficiently. We don't want perfection. We just want good enough. And that's oftentimes where people get into trouble with this, is they're like, mm, it's not perfect, or I think I see a pattern. No, we're looking for the residual, but there's no general pattern that we can see uh, on the surface. So a scatter plot shows a nice linear relationship, but this model is problematic. And I want you to think, if we look, the data points are close to our line, and then they start getting spread out. If we look at the residual plot, we can see a similar thing, where our residuals are small, and our residuals then start growing. The problem with this here is the residuals suggest the accuracy of the model 
drops off at high values of the x variable. The variability does not remain consistent across all levels of the predictor variable. So we want this covariance, this residual, we want the scatter to be true throughout. If it starts getting more spread out, our model start, stops being as accurate as it was earlier on, which may lead to us thinking a linear model would not be appropriate. How about a curvilinear shape in the scatter plot? You can see that this curvilinear goes up and then comes back down is more readily apparent in the residual plot. And it's, in fact, that curvilinear that we see in the original scatter is just accentuated in the residuals. Always note, when we're looking at these types of plots, what are you looking at? That's why it's so important to label your axes. And even better, if you give them titles, then it's even clearer to your audience which one you're talking about. So no regression analysis is complete without a graph of the residuals. We use that to check the linear, if the linear model is reasonable. Residuals might unveil subtle variations in the data that were not so obvious in the plot of the original data. In a sense, the residual plot magnifies deviations from the model. It may seem counterintuitive to check the sufficiency of linearity after you've already run the regression, but that is in fact what we do. And it's always necessary to check, check the residual plots for patterns that you might have missed in the original scatter. You must run a linear regression to see if you can run the linear regression. It's kind of weird. We do the analysis and we get the line and we get the R, we get the R squared, we get the uh, standard deviation of our residuals. And then we look at the residual plot and go, okay, was this good? Or should we start thinking of different models? So another example, how are sugar content and calories related in breakfast cereal? So our explanatory variable is sugar and our predicted variable or response variable are calories. And if we look at this, I would say that it is a uh, moderate to weak, positive, linear association between sugar in grams and calories in uh, kilocalories. So just a reminder, how are sugar content and calories related in a breakfast cereal? What we saw before is we use these type of summary statistics. So we have our average calories and our standard deviation for calories of our cereals of 107 and 19.5. We have our average X, or in this case, the average sugar is seven grams with a standard deviation of 4.4. Both of these, we want them to be normal, or we are assuming normality in order to do this analysis. So just a reminder, if we have our correlation of 0.564, we can find our slope. R is equal to S of Y over S of X. This should look familiar. Our Y intercept is the average minus the slope times the average X value. So we do that, we get 89.5 calories. So our least square re regression line would be Y hat equals 89.5 plus, plus 2.5x, or if we put this in context, we have our predicted calories, or calories hat, equals 89.5 plus 2.5 sugar. If we want to go from r to r squared, we simply square 0.564, and we get 31.8%. So as we have practiced, interpret the slope, interpret the y-intercept, interpret r squared. So we should look at this and say, for every additional uh, one gram increase of sugar, our cereal will increase in 89.5 calories. And our y-intercept, when there are zero grams of sugar, we should expect the cereal to be 89.5 calories. With our r squared, we should think, 31.8% of the variability in calories is accounted for by the variability in the sugar content. Now, once we have our normal model, we look at our scatter plot, and then we should also look at our, our plot for our residuals. I do want you to notice that generally, we have this line of best fit 
but we do have some above and some below. And if we look at the plot of our residuals, we should start seeing those same type of outliers that are hovering above and below our values. One is under, one is drastically over, and then the rest are randomly scattered throughout. This residual plot suggests that a linear model is appropriate. You are also expected to look at both a histogram of the residuals and a scatter plot of the residuals versus the predicted values in the regression predicting calories from sugar content. So what do I mean by a histogram of the residuals? Well, you know those outliers we saw below and our outliers we saw above? Those show up in our histogram of the residuals. Our histogram should look normal. And by normal, we mean unimodal and symmetric. No outliers, no gaps. Same thing for our residual model. The small modes in the histogram are marked with different colors and symbols in the residual plot. The question is, what do you see from these high up serials and these low up serials? That's a question for you guys to think about. If you want to move, uh, get to that in class, make sure you ask. We have a couple more slides, and then we're going to end this video. If we're talking about subgroups, if the researcher discovers there's a small subgroup in the data, it might be appropriate to run individual analyses for each of the groupings. Here's an important condition, often not considered, for creating linear models. All the data must come from the same group. Think shoe sizes for men and women. The previous statement does not mean you must separate the individual groupings. Perhaps the researcher wants the single group, or, and perhaps the researcher will separate. That decision is determined by the researcher and the purpose of analysis. Continuing on with those subgroups, looking at sugars and calories, the figures show regression line fit to calories and sugar for each of the three cereal shelves. So what do you think each shelf contains in a supermarket? So if you went to Kroger, you went to Meyer, you went to Costco, whatever, you're going to get multiple shelves. Well, if you think how things are organized, maybe shelf one is in blue and then shelf two is in And then shelf three in green, low sugar to high sugar, there's a lot more steepness and the more sugars added, the higher the calorie count. Well, once we start separating and teasing this data out and looking at these subgroups, we can start seeing that the healthier cereals versus the kind of healthy light, but also sugary cereals versus like the ones you have like frosted flakes or fruity pebbles or the ones that are just sugar, get those kids amped to go. We can start separating these groups out to see trends in subgroups of the data. We're going to pause. We looked at subgroups. We're going to talk about extrapolation and finish up chapter nine in the second part of the video. See you next time, Falcons.